So let's do that before we even go to a slideshow. Let's let's talk about some things. So some people actually talk about the hips as though they're a bucket or a cup. Because if you think about them, hold on, I'll make this work here. If you think about them, these hip bones that are curved here kind of make a bucket. Um, and they hold your intestines and stuff. This is kind of a bucket, this area right here. It's a baby bucket. <laughs> um, and so it's not, an it's not an unusual thing to kind of talk about that, right? And so once again, guys, if I have any muscle in front of this bucket and it pulls, it's going to cause the top to go forward, right? What kind of tilt do we call this? An anterior tilt. An anterior tilt. By the way, I admit that usually this thing is hooked to a femur down here. So if this, if this thing, if this muscle shortens, you're either going to get an anterior tilt or if it shortens, you're going to pull up the femur, which is a flexion of the hip. Anterior tilt really is a flexion of the tilt, hip, uh, hip. Because in an anterior tilt, I'm getting closer to my thigh. In a flexion of my hip, I'm getting closer to my thigh as well. Like if you were in space floating around, you wouldn't really know if you were anterior tilting or flexing your hip because they're the same thing. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, good. I'm thank By the way, Ms. Petrie, I actually appreciate what you do. Because some people won't admit that. They'll just be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I think I get it. Um, let me put it to you this way. Sorry. I've got a funky finger, so it's Wait, the anterior tilt and the afflection of the hip are the same thing? Yes. So, let me... I don't know how that makes sense. I, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. So, give me a second. I thought you said everything is opposite. <laughs> what? I thought you said yesterday things were opposite, that if your belly's in front, then that's an anterior tilt. If the butt's in the back, then that's a posterior tilt. No. So the opposite. It's the opposite. If your butt's in back, you're... Because look, here, let's do that. Well, I, I've got two things to show you. But one is... I'm so confused. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. And it's probably partially my fault. So let's do it. Let's figure it out together. All right. Let's do this. Just so we know. Blue side is the anterior side. This is the front side, right? Okay. If I pull this, this is an anterior tilt. It's going to the front, okay? That's all, just, just say that. But where did the bottom go? Out. It went back. It actually went back. So this is what's confusing to people is when you see my butt go back, it's because the top of my hips went forward. And we measure anterior tilts from the top. Right. We measure posterior tilts from the top, too. Look, if, let me get two different colored tapes so we can really watch what we're doing here. All right. Bear with me. It is conceptually tricky. There's no doubt about it. All right, hold on. I better finish this coffee. I'm going to spill it. All right, now you're in trouble because I've had my coffee. Okay. All right. I am putting these colors on here just so that we can have a, a two-sided thing here. In fact, I'm going to move a little bit more front so you can see them. All right. Okay. Anterior, posterior. Just because I called it. So blue is anterior. All right? When the top goes forward, we call that an anterior tilt. But what happened to the bottom here? It went posterior. When the top goes back, we call that posterior tilt. But what happened to the bottom here? It went anterior. Because your hips are like a circle or a cup, 
And so you've got to decide what are we going to call it. We, we decide to talk about the top moving. We say when the top moves forward, we're going to call that anterior tilt, even though the bottom moved back. But we're going to talk about it from the top because we got to pick a place to talk about it from. Because two things happen. Every time this cup moves, something goes forward and something goes back. Something goes forward and something goes back. So we just choose to talk about it from the front, from the top, because that's the best way to talk about it. And when my hip anteriorly tilts, my butt comes back. It sticks out. So, strangely, when I anteriorly tilt, I posteriorly protrude. When I anteriorly, I mean, when I posteriorly tilt, my groin comes forward. Because this is kind of a circle. When you, let's see, when you anteriorly tilt, this top part does come forward, but the bottom part comes back. Can we see that? I wish I could turn it more, but I can't. It won't go more. When the top goes forward, the bottom goes back. When the bottom goes forward, the top goes back. So we decide to talk about tilts from the top. We just had to. We had to pick a place because if we talk about them from the bottom, it's the opposite. So we said, okay, when this goes forward, we're calling it an anterior tilt. However, when we do that, look what happens to this person's butt. Six out more. So that's why it's confusing, Miss Petrie, because there is a posterior thing going on when there's an anterior tilt. But we just had to pick a spot since two things are happening and talk about, we always talk about the top. What's the top doing? Well, the top's moving forward. We call that anterior tilt. That's just the name we gave it. But it does cause this weird thing. So if somebody comes with their butt sticking out in back, and you're like, oh, you're anterior tilted. They're going to be like, what? I feel posteriorly tilted. Yeah, that's just the way we talk about it. Cool. So that helps a little bit, right? I hope that a little bit. Okay. It's a start. Then, I mean... cool thing about this is, and this part I think works 100% of the time, and I've been kind of saying it since the beginning of class, in order for something to pull something in front, it's got to be in front. So any muscle that's attached to your hip in front is going to cause a anterior tilt. Any muscle hooked in back, any muscle, like your hamstrings, but even like your adductor magnus that's way in back is going to cause a Posterior tilt. Now, the confusing part, though, was, was and they very validly asked, uh, Miss Petrie was like, how can an anterior tilt and flexion be the same thing? So let me do this little demonstration. Is, is the orange pen moving closer to the blue pen or is the blue pen moving closer to the orange pen? You don't know, do you, right? So, if this is my hip and I start to anteriorly tilt, am I not getting closer to my femur? I am. If I flex my femur, am I not getting closer to my hip? So you're able to see this. But you have to realize it's the same thing. It's just these things hinging closer together. Now, when somebody's standing and they start bending over, we say, well, that looks like an anterior tilt. And when they lift up one leg and they bring it up here, we say that's a flexion. But the fact is they are the same thing. And by the way, the same thing is true in back. Extensions of the leg are the same as posterior tilts. Extensions of the leg are the same as posterior tilts because this angle gets closer together. Can you show what that actually looks like, though? Like, yeah, I, I think maybe I can. I think maybe I can. I don't know if I if I'm understanding completely. I'm sorry for no, no, anybody no, no. else. I'm slowing no, down here. No, no, I don't think you're slowing anybody else down. And I see Miss Hanson like, please, the more the merrier. And by the way, I have never had a class that has not a hard time with this, which means that I need to learn how to teach it better too. So you're helping me. So don't worry, okay? And it's by the way, 
The cool thing about this, everybody, is the reason we're spending so much time on this is once you get these concepts, all this stuff will just make sense. You'll be like, oh, well, that homework wasn't so hard, and that wasn't such a big deal, and this is kind of... So let's work, let's spend some time on it. Okay. So, let me think how to do this. I'm doing this so you can see the side of my body. Just so I have a sideline, okay? Because otherwise I'm a big black blob. So this doesn't represent anything. This is just the side of my body, okay? And this is about where my hip joint is, okay? This is me anteriorly tilting. Do we agree on that? Okay, do we see what happened at this joint right here? This axis came close to that one. This is me flexing my leg. Do we see what happened at this axis here? Now watch, I'm gonna keep this leg like this. I'm gonna put that leg on the ground. Now I'm anteriorly tilting. Now we might call it a flexion, but it's the same thing. Does that make sense? It's just bending at your hip. I bent at my hip. So, it's really the same thing, basically, if you do it on both sides. Right? This is me flexing my hip, but ironically, when I flex my hip, my, I anteriorly tilt. I mean, because these axes come next to each other. I can get this thing up like this, or I can get it up, I can get it over like this, but it's still the same thing. It's a joint. You know? It, it, it's a joint. This side comes to this side, or this side comes to this side, but it's still a joint, and they're getting closer together or further apart. Extension's the same thing. My leg can come back, right? And this goes back, or my hip can come back, and this comes back. I can't extend very much, so. Does that help a little bit? Yes, Miss Hunter, please. Save me. So, when you, no, you're, that's great. Everything you just said is great. I was just going to say that when you're explaining it, like here in the, you know, in the video, I understand it. Like, I can understand it, but when I'm reading it, it's super confusing. Like, when we read the questions, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, I'm like, I, it makes it, it looks so simple when you do it, but when I'm reading the questions, I don't know if it's the language or if it's just not connecting or whatever, but like, a lot of times I'm like, oh, okay, this will be what it, what it should do, and then it's wrong. And I'm like, why, why is it wrong? Yeah. So I, I'm assuming I'm just not getting the, the lingo correct or something. I don't know. Well, let, let me be honest as a teacher, too. It's Unfortunately, when we write questions, we're expecting a certain answer, and that's not completely fair, right? And so you're trying to figure out the answer and what is TAPS got looking for and all that kind of stuff. And that's just kind of part of the problem with education, really, in a way. Right? Part of the problem with testing. Um, uh, but, but you're right. The language is extremely confusing, right? Because you guys are still, like, like Miss Petrie is just admitting, it's still confusing that an anterior tilt and a flexion are the same thing, and she's trying to visualize that in her head. So somebody says, hey, when the posterior superior thing is doing this thing over here and the opposite thing of that's happening, there's a contraction, but this other muscle is lengthening, what happens on a Tuesday? And you're like, yes. what the <laughs> hell? You know? Exactly. It's probably how Miss Nguyen feels all the time, where she's like, I understood two out of the 20 words you said, like, what do I do with that? Right? Um, that is hard. So I, I admit that. And we're still all having occasional mistakes with superior, inferior, posterior, lateral, medial, all that stuff, rotations and all this type of stuff. Um, so I, I, you're right. I think the language is a big part. And, we're, and I, all of a sudden now, we're halfway through the course, and I'm like, figure it out. Right? It's really hard. I agree. Yes. Um, Ms. Harper, Yes. Um, I just wanted to to clarify if what I think is right. Okay. Um, if it is a hip flexors, it is anteriorly tilt, right? And if it is a hip extensors, extend, it's posteriorly tilt. Is that right? Yes. So another way, you, by the way, it's 100% right. If I understood you, it's 100% right what you said. And so we could say hip flexors are anterior tilters. 
Okay. I've never heard anybody say that, but we could. Okay. And hip extenders are anterior, I mean, are posterior tilters. Posterior. Yeah. Okay. And that's what you just said, right? And because, because you got to remember, everybody, we're getting kind of confused, quite understandably, but... Hold on. Do this again. Just bear with me. I don't mean like that. I meant... All muscles work on joints, right? So let's just pretend this little hinge joint here, right? There's a muscle here. I don't care what muscle this is, right? Okay? There. That's my orange muscle. These are two pink bones. Okay? Muscles can only do one thing. Contract. Right? These, it can only bring these two bones closer together. Right? So if this person's floating in outer space and this thing contracts, these bones come closer together, which one's coming closer to the other one? Which one's the origin insertion? They're just attachments. Now, when somebody's standing, we say, okay, this is the origin, this isn't moving, and this guy's coming closer to this one. This is the insertion. But they're both just attachments, they're coming. So one of these could be a femur and one could be a hip. The fact is, flexion and, and anterior tilt are just the same thing. They really are. Because it's happening at the hip joint. And anterior tilt happens because you bend at your hip joint. We're not talking about spinal movement. We're talking about your hip going. And where is it rotating? It's rotating on your hip joint. Right? So our skeleton here is unfortunately not standing on the ground. It'd be kind of cool if he was. But if his hip anteriorly tilts, He's able to do that because he, he bends here at the hip. So to him, it's or her, it's the same thing as a hip flexion. There's a bending here at the hip. In fact, quite often we anteriorly tilt when we hip flex. So if that, I hope that helps a little bit. Okay. All right. I'm not expecting you to be like, oh my gosh, I understand the entire meaning of life now. Thank you, Tap Scott. But is it a little clearer, maybe? Is there any question that somebody can ask? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Torres, please. So, on the, uh, on the homework, you, you, you asked each muscle what um, tilt did it make? You're cutting out. I think you're about to make a good point, but you're cutting out. So on the homework, I asked what what each what tilt each muscle would make. Okay, let me start again. Okay. Yes. Is the answer um, interior interior tilt? Uh, for which muscle? To all of them. Uh, like sartorius, tensor fascia lata, and all three of them. Iliosomus. If they're bilateral, yes. Yeah, because they're all in front, basically, and they're all going to have to pull in front, right? You can't pull them back from in front. So, yes, if they're bilateral. Now, some of you gave me really astute answers and okay. said, hey. So, there was yeah, go ahead. One, one that you said, it was, I think, the, the ilios, uh, iliosoas, mm -hmm. the ilios psoas. So, you said unilaterally. So, that one, what, made the lateral tilt, or what tilt did it make? That was a super hard question we've never discussed, and I'm happy to discuss it now. So, um, let's do that. Let's do that. Wait, you should date... If, what? If, if we are already on the same page, because... I think we're all going to get confused. So make sure, okay, if you cut out every other word there, but I think you said, wait, you should make sure we're all on the same page because we're going to get confused more if you go into that question yet, right? Mr. Tapscott, the, um, for the silk, for the ilio, so as video, 
the questions are if the muscle is bilaterally yeah, kind tight, of. what I, kind of pelvic tilt could it create? Yeah. And then the second question is, do you want me to go through them one by one? Or do you Stop want right there on that one. Yeah, stop right there on that one. Okay. So, by the way, I think this threw people off too, but if a muscle is tight, then it is therefore contracted or shortened or performing its action, right? And so... But if it's tied laterally tight, that, that means it's together, right? Both sides, bilateral, both okay. sides are pulling, yes. And that's when you're going to get definitely an anterior tilt. And tightness is like a, a contraction. It's a shortening. It's so whatever the action of that muscle is, that's what it's doing. If my bicep is tight, it is trying to flex my arm, right? Or if it shortens, if my bicep shortens, saying the same thing, it's going to flex my arm. Okay. So if the muscle is bilaterally tight, what kind of pelvic? tilt could it create it would be an anterior tilt because it is in front mm -hmm. my hips these are my hips i just lifted them up here for you guys to see because there's stuff pulling in front of them yeah anterior tilt okay so the second question is for the iliopsoas the second question is if the muscle is unilaterally tight what structural problem might it create? Yes. And now, but, in my mind, I was thinking a lateral tilt because it's one side. Well, definitely a decent answer. Let's look at it even harder. So, you're going to have to see my hips for this, I think. Um, and this is what Ms. Torres was asking. Yeah. And we have basically never discussed this. I was kind of curious what would happen. So, well, so, okay. So muscles actions don't really change in some ways because they're unilateral or bilateral. So it's really gonna create a flexion on just that one hip, right? So, so for example, if my, my iliopsoas can create an anterior tilt, but it can also create a, a, it can create a flexion on my hips. So, so if it does one side only, which it can. When I do this, by the way, I'm using my iliopsoas on just one side unilaterally. Okay? That's just me lifting my leg. What would happen if just one side of my hip anteriorly tilted? Watch what would happen. I don't know if it's okay for me to answer because I raised my hand, but I don't think you can see it. Raise your hand. I mean, I, I, please answer. Well, you would tend to tilt to one side, but your back is not going to keep you walking like that, so you lean back to the center. Yeah, maybe. But also, if I flex, well, if I flex here... Uh-huh. It actually causes me to rotate because I'm bending here, but I'm not necessarily bending on the other side. And it actually can cause a rotation because it's flexing on this side only. Okay, but how does your body even it out then? Because you don't walk like that. You're right. Now my spine's going to do some funky stuff and twist back the other way to try to fix that. Like that's hard. That's where I get confused. Yeah. Yeah. And that... That, you could debate all sorts of stuff. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But my point is, if one side kicks in, when both sides kick in, we kind of get this. If one side kicks in, it just collapses on one side. And that's where you get the torquing is my body does try to compensate. So what would you call that kind of tip then? Um, a twisting. A twisting of the hip. Yeah. Yeah, I would say it's Is kind it of... just me or if I've not heard the term of twisting of the hip yet? <laughs> it's not just you, you haven't heard it. I've never used it. I've never used it. I've never used it. And so I know you're like, well, what the heck? You gave me homework where you, I'm supposed to use a term I've never used. 
Um, I actually gave grades to people who put some real thought in it and came back with something. Even lateral tilts, I think you'll notice on some of your homework, I was like, that's pretty good. Like, at least you're kind of getting this concept that one side's pulling. You know what I mean? Uh, but I think so that's a good question. What? Who? Sorry, Denny. No, no, no. Go, go, go. Yeah, please, 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 please. Okay, so if you had said, like, a lateral tilt, that's, like, technically a part of the answer, but you need to be more specific in saying, like, what it, how it changes your body, like, the way yeah. you look. Yeah. That's what you're saying? Yeah, I just want to also, I mean, okay, here was my grading philosophy. It... And, and by the way, I'm happy to give points to anybody who's like, you did not follow that philosophy of me. Um, but my philosophy was one, just did you put some effort in? Like, did I get more than 12 words and stuff? Um, um, but secondly, did it kind of make some kind of sense? Lateral tilt starts to make some kind of sense. And, and there were some people that I don't even think they intended to do this. I really mean this. But some people I said, how, how would it affect your posture? And they basically said it would mess your posture up. I'm like, well, everything messes your posture up. Like, I need something. Like, do you think your well, spine's going to bend? Do you think you're going to... Uh, I yeah. think that the hips would be uneven. I mean, like, you would have a lateral tilt, so your hips would be one is higher than the other. Yeah, okay. I mean, I don't think that muscle actually no, does that because it doesn't do anything lateral. That, that's correct. I'm just saying that that's, that's what my personal answer yeah. was. Because that's where my thought process was going, is that, okay, so it would be a tilt, and so, therefore, I guess the hips would be uneven, because one would be higher than the other, but that's not exactly correct either. It's not so, exactly correct, however, and I'm not even trying to be, like, I'm not trying to make it all rosy. It's a very good guess, and the reason it's a very good guess is you said, hey, something's pulling on one side, not the other. Like, that's probably going to give lateral tilt. Like, that's a very good guess. But, unfortunately, this muscle is not on the side. It's in front. And if one side yeah. pulls, it starts to kind of create this kind of rotation. Yeah. But I love anybody that said, like, hey, it's pulling this side. Maybe it would get us a lateral tilt. I'm like, yes, at least we're kind of thinking that kind of concept of both sides do this way, one side does this way. I mean, it makes sense. So unilaterally tilting is still part of the answer, but then the other part would be that how it would make your body shape differently is that it would do a medial turn, a rotation. It would create a rotation I just of the hip. Wanna, I just want to understand. That's all. It would create a rotation of the hip. Yeah, because one side is collapsing, and it would create a rotation of the hip. Because if I'm bending just on this leg, it creates a rotation of the hip. I mean, if I'm just I bending this leg like this, that's fine. But because this leg's bent and this one's not, this one's getting pulled. Boom. You guys do this when you do abdominal stuff, right? If just one side of your abdominal muscles pull, right? We talked about twisting. You twist. If just one side of your iliopsoas pulls, you tend to twist. Does that make sense? A little bit? But you are flexing. If I bend, just do it with yourself. Just bend that hip and not the other one. You've got to do this. <laughs> that looks stupid doing it, but that's what you got to do. All right, hold on. I'll come back to you, but I want to ask, like, there's other hands up, and they, and they might help us clarify what we're trying to talk about. Obviously, I, I need help, too. Uh... Ms. Torres, is your hand just still up or do you have more to say or add or anything? Um, yeah, so, so I, I, my internet was acting up when, when you were, when, when you were explaining, so I didn't really get it. Okay. So your internet was acting up when I was explaining the, the flexion and. About the, the. Working unilaterally. Oh, okay. All right. So, and about this twisting thing and everything, right? Let's do it this way. No, can I ask you a question about the answer? Yeah. Okay, hold on. Got it. All 
Okay. Here are your hips again. Remember I said they're a bucket. This is the iliopsoas and this is the iliopsoas. I gave them two different colors because this is your right iliopsoas and this is your left iliopsoas, right? If I pull them both, I don't want to dump, dump my coffee out, but if I, if I bilaterally flex them, we get an anterior tilt, right? If I unilaterally flex it, it tends to tilt it on one side only. And the problem is when you tilt on one side only, you start to rotate. So you anteriorly tilt, but only on one side, and that causes a problem because you have to rotate to have that happen. Because the other side's not coming down with you. This side's coming down, and so it tends to anteriorly rotate. I'm sorry, yeah, okay. that's not a word though. It tends to rotate. I brought, I brought the question up to talk about something really advanced, which we talk about torquing of the body. So, yeah. uh, what is the name of the tilt? Sorry? Well, I, actually, I would, I would argue that it's more a rotation of the hips. It starts to cause the hips to torque, to rotate, to do something like that. Because this side gets pulled down while the other side doesn't, and that starts to cause this, this rotating. If you grab my, my shoulder and pull it down on this side, I don't just come straight down. I tend to kind of come over, right? I tend to start to twist. So it's not a tilt? I mean, did you call it a unilateral tilt? A unilateral anterior tilt? I guess that would be legitimate. No, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I would call it a torquing or a twisting of the hips, or if you want to make up some new terms that are probably legitimate, a unilateral anterior tilt, one side anteriorly tilting. Sure. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you for being patient with me. Uh, Miss Monreal, I'm going to come back to you, Miss Jonas. <laughs> Miss Monreal. You still had your hand up. I just want to make sure I hadn't left you out. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can. Okay. Um, so just, well, first of all, if you guys have any questions for me, um, I am the expert on this because I have it. <laughs> you've got a, you've got so, a torquing? So I, I chronic I chronically have a twisted pelvis, which is what they'll call it, you know. Um, but yeah, so I guess my whole point with that was, you guys don't see me walking around like a freak, I assume. Right. You know, so the body does even out, but I tend to have kind of like a waddle. <laughs> yeah. If, if, um, so I just, I wanted to point that out so people know what to look for when you have a client who may have that issue, you're not going to see them leaning over to one side. Yeah, um, I agree. Anyway. Thank you. Ms. Shanas, you were going to and say And also, oh. my mind is blown. I didn't know that you made corrections or comments on homework. Oh my God, I've been commenting on your homework, like, since the beginning of school. I've never even seen that, I've never even known. Oh my gosh, so I'm, I'm like, oh, Miss Montreal, this is really clever, and blah, blah, blah. So now I'm going to go look at it. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. I'll pro I probably commented on every homework you've ever done. Um, anyway. <laughs> thank you. Um, think of all the emails you've missed for me, too. I'm like, you're the love of my life. I've got a million dollars for you. Just come by and pick it up. Yes. Miss Giannis. Yeah, okay. So I guess for me, I'm getting caught up in that it has to be a tilt, but it's not, that's not always the answer, I guess is what I'm trying to figure out. Cause I want to keep saying it's a tilt of the hip, but you're saying it's a rotation. And I guess if I had read the question a little bit better, maybe I would have caught that cause it doesn't even ask what kind of tilt it creates. But for me, I keep thinking, I want to say like, it's doing this kind of tilt, but necessarily I'm not, it's not always making like an anterior tilt or like a lateral tilt. It can rotate your body. 
Let me answer that more. All right, so by the way, one thing is this is stuff that massage therapists, good massage therapists argue about. So this is really high level stuff. And I apologize for taking you guys so far down this rabbit hole, but I think the discussion's worth it. Um, it is an anterior tilt still, but on one side only. And what happens when one side tilts anteriorly is it does tilt, but that starts to create a rotation. If you have something on two stilts, which are your legs, and you pull down one side only, it starts to cause this rotation too. So unilateral anterior tilting would be correct. And then what happens from that? Um, and so let me show you something, by the way, because you're going to have clients like this. These two little X's here, I'm often looking at these at people. This is where their uh, as is is, their anterior superior iliac spine, right? If I see these go down, that tells me they are anteriorly tilting. If I see them go back, they're posteriorly tilting. If one goes down on one side and the other one goes up, you have this kind of rotation that occurs. And that's how you can see a rotation is you're like, wait a second, your hips are pointing over there, but your legs are pointing here. That's weird. That's, so one that's, hip won't be higher than the other. One hip would be higher than the other, yes. Yes, because only one is anteriorly tilting. And so the hips, literally one's coming down like this, and the other one's not, and it's actually gonna cause it to rotate a little bit. Okay. It also, by the way, and maybe Ms. Moen Rial can tell us if she has this experience. It can also cause you a lot of pain and discomfort in your um, sacroiliac joint. Because back here, the hip is supposed to act as a unit. And if one side is anteriorly tilting, this is the back side of the body here. If one side is anteriorly tilting, it puts a lot of stress right here in this joint here. If both sides, it's not quite as bad, but if one side's coming one way and one side's coming the other way, it causes a lot of stress in this area. Do, Ms. Monreal, do you have that kind of problem? Do you get kind of low back pain deep down in your sacrum? Absolutely. It's yeah. hurting me very much this week. Yes, yes, yes. So it gives you kind of a pain back there. So do I probably, but... Um, Ms. Monreal, did the, uh, are the uh, abductor stretches, do they help with that? They did. They helped yesterday, but it usually only lasts for about an hour. So I need to like figure out how to make things last longer. Yeah. Right. Right. But I'm glad that at least it was somewhat helpful then, you know, to take yes. some yeah, it away. Yeah. So maybe if it was more like continuous, then maybe that would continue Absolutely. to work for you as well as maybe other things. But it's good to know for, um, for us who don't know enough about it that at least uh, the type of stretching helps with that. Yeah, and I try to do it myself, but it's not the same as when somebody else gives you that resistance. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Agreed. Absolutely. Agreed. And by the way, it's very common when you have torquing to have one side of adductors that's really tight and the other side that's not because that's part of the torquing uh, experience. Mr. Pascott, yeah. I guess I'm not understanding it, but... We can just do it after class. Like, if you could just go over my answer with me to, like, what I wrote just to kind of, like... Actually, I might want to do that with you right now, but hold on one second. Okay. I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but I think your answer was very complete, so I think it gives us something to unpack, and we'll look at it. Uh, Miss, Miss Danley, I'm so you've been very patiently. You've had your hand up. Mm. I don't know, I feel like mine's kind of stupid now. Oh gosh, no. At this point, we wouldn't even know if it was stupid. We're all so confused. I'm confused. What's your question? Well, it's more like a confusion, and I don't really know how to put it into a question. Understood. But, like, I get confused with, like, terminology, because you'll say things a certain way with certain words, and then we'll get to homework, and it seems like some of the words changed in the words I haven't seen before. And then, like, I'll go into lab, and Mr. Yabara changes the words entirely to different words. Yep. So I'm hearing three different terminologies, and you guys are saying it means the same thing, and I don't know what I'm answering anymore. Yeah. So uh, I, I actually am aware of this. I'm aware that the book talks different than I talk. It talks different than Mr. Yabara talks. And I actually looked into, should we make all the language systematized, right? Would make sense, wouldn't it? Make your life a lot easier. Except yeah. that the entire massage community 
talks like Mr. Ibarra, me, and the book. Well, it was like yesterday you were talking about like active assistance and active resistance, and there's like another word for like resisting or something. But then we got into class and Mr. Ibarra started saying it's like isometric or isolated something, and I, that's from like way in the beginning, and I remember talking about it, but I didn't remember what it meant. Yeah, um, he's, he is not using different language, well, he has used, but he's using language, he's just describing something in a different way, just like, kind of like the anterior tilt can also be a flexion, and so both ways are legitimate. And I will explain isometrics and things like that here in a second to help clear that up, if that helps. That helps. Let's, let's do a little bit more unpacking here. Let's, for one thing, let's back up a second, Okay. Everybody, then we'll come back to this, and Miss Jonas will go over your stuff too. Let's take a look at this skeleton here. Let's just really quick go back to basics because I've now confused the heck out of all of you, and let's make sure that we've got some basics, right? Okay. What's the word for front? Anterior. Thank Anterior. you. And what's the word for back? Posterior. Yes. What's the word for outside or moving to the outside? Would it be lateral? Lateral. And what's the word for towards the middle? Medial. Yes. And what's the word for up? Um, superior. Yep. And what's the word for down? Inferior. Inferior. Okay. And if I have muscles directly on the side of the hip and I pull them, Right? What kind of tilt are we going to get? Lateral. Lateral. And if I have muscles in the back and I pull them, what kind of tilt am I going to get on both sides? Just keep it both right now. Both Posterior. sides. Posterior. Posterior. And if I have muscles in front and I pull on them, what kind of, on both sides, what kind of tilt are we going to get? Anterior. Anterior. Okay. That's all still true, everybody. All right? When things are working bilaterally and they're truly in like nice normal places, like really in front, really in back, really on the sides, all that stuff still happens. And most massage therapists don't know it. And I think everybody in class understands that, which is great. Okay. Now today, by the way, if I pull this on both sides, on both sides, let's just do this. This is a made up muscle. This muscle doesn't exist. But if I pull both sides, what type of tilt do we say that gives us? Anterior. If I didn't let these hips tilt, if I stopped them from tilting, what would happen if this muscle contracted? It would tear, break. I don't, I don't really know. I mean, how do you? A flexion. Flexion. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, how do you stop it from so contracting? Th this muscle actually, this muscle actually <laughs> doesn't know. <laughs> This muscle actually doesn't know what it's doing. It just pulls. And if it can, if your body lets it pull this thing down, it's an anterior tilt. If it doesn't let it pull that thing down, it'll try to pull your legs up. And then you're right. If it can't do either, it'll tear. I got that. But, but that's just kind of showing you how a flexion is the same as an anterior tilt. Okay. Okay. So what got super, super confusing for all of us is... The iliopsoas isn't on the outside of the body. It's on the inside of the body. That makes things a lot more confusing. Yeah, it's a little lateral, but it's way in here. It's way in here. So it's not something outside that just automatically creates a tilt to the pelvis, right? It's not that simple. In fact, if it's pulling on the pelvis, it's actually pulling on it from the inside. And that's where you get this really funky stuff where, sure, if both sides pull, it lifts the legs up, you know. If both sides pull, it kind of tilts all this down. But if one side pulls, you start to get these really weird torquing actions because it's inside pulling. So it's a very complicated, very misunderstood muscle. And I'm not saying that even explains everything to you. I'm just telling you, if it was out here, that would be great. Because then you'd get this lateral tilt stuff. It's not out there. It's inside here. And so it, it can't, it, 
when it pulls on the hip, if anything, it pulls it inwardly a little bit, right? It just doesn't behave like you would think. So your common logic, so Mr. Tapscott told you all this stuff like, if it's in front, it pulls in front. If it's in back, it pulls in back. If it's on the sides, it pulls on the sides. That's true. And then he said, what about this muscle? It's kind of in front, kind of on the sides, but it's inside of the sides. And so it made it hard, really hard, really hard. But it still does the actions the book says, it flexes the hip. And so if it flexes the hip on one side, what happens? And when I flex my hip on one side, I fall in on that side and my body tends to rotate. And you just have to stand up and do it <laughs> to feel it. I mean, it's kind of like salsa. It's like sure you dance salsa. But if you're flexing, you were. Oh no, never mind. Well, no. I guess I don't understand what flexing your hip actually means. Thank you. Flexing means closing the angle. And so my hip hooks into my pelvis, and, and whether my femur. Hmm, good question. Good, good question. I'm really glad you're asking this. All right, let's see if we can do this. Let's bring this camera down here. Good. Because I guess in my mind, I'm thinking that if I'm flexing my hip, then my knee is coming up. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. You're absolutely right, by the way. Um, if this hip anteriorly tilts, goes forward here, what joint is it anteriorly tilting around? Like, what joint is moving? If this thing goes forward. Your hip joint? Yeah. And if my leg is moving, what joint is moving? Your hip joint? Your yeah. Hip? Yeah, exactly. So, it's, it's, it's a misunderstanding what the hip is. When the, when the hip anteriorly tilts, it's doing it because it goes around the, the hip socket. <laughs> That's why it can anteriorly tilt. It's got to go around. And when your femur comes up, it's going around the hip socket too. And so to your body, what's the difference? Nothing. Nothing. All right. This is important enough that, hold on, we're taking the skeleton apart. It's that serious. Hold on. All right, let's come to this. Oh, God. there we go. This is half a hip. I just tore it off. I just cut it at the pubic symphysis, and I just cut it at the sacroiliac joint. All right. Miss Petrie, look at this. This is an anterior tilt, right? This is a flexion. They both involve the same joint. Now what am I doing, anterior tilting or flexing? I can't tell either. But they're just getting closer together. Now, when somebody's standing still and they anterior tilt, we kind of say, well, that's anterior tilting, their hips moving. And when they keep their hips straight and they lift their leg, we say, well, that's flexion. But they're the same thing. A muscle in here is shortening, right? That's the thing. So hold on. Some muscle, this is a magic muscle I just made up, although this could be kind of like the rectus femoris, but anyway. Some muscle in here is shortening, and if it shortens, either the hip has to come down or the leg has to come up. But this angle in here is what's going to change, and it's all about this joint. There's no difference. And if the person was on their butt, they could both do it come together. You could anteriorly tilt and flex at the same time, because they are the same thing. When muscles, when muscles contract, they just try to bring two things close to each other, and they succeed every time, basically. Right? Well, if, how, um, so that I guess my question is, if both are true, then 
If the muscle is unilaterally tight, what structural problem might it create? So you could say uh, flexion of the hip then. You could actually. So that would have been a good like trick on me because you could say, you could have, I didn't even think about this until you just said it, but it's actually quite brilliant what you just said. You I could, guess that's I, where I, my confusion you, was because I just, you, you could say that the answer was that it was a unilateral inferior. Well, I was, a, I'm talking about, I'm, yeah, I'm talking about standing, but still, you could have said, okay. you could have said, tap Scott, if your iliopsoas tightens, you do this. That's one okay. unilaterally, and that'd be 100% true. However, what happens if this leg stays down and it tightens? But I would have loved that answer. If you were just like, oh, you'd raise that leg. <laughs> you'd flex that no, one leg. No, I just leg. wanted to make sure that I understood that. That's why I love the answer that you all said. all tying in together that I'm. It's true. You're after, that's why I love the answer that you gave. It's true. You would lift that leg. That's what the muscle does. But it also brings that hip down. And so if the leg doesn't lift, and by the way, the reason it's a structural right. issue is if that muscle is always tight, I can't, it definitely does this, but I can't walk like this. So I got to put this leg down, but remember, this muscle is tight, so when I put this leg down, that happens. Does that help everybody? So if I flex, this muscle just flexes the hip. Anterior tilt, flex the hip, I don't care, whatever. It just makes this thing shorter. Let's leave this short and put this leg down. I can't put it down without doing what? Did I come straight forward? I twisted. I torqued. It's an extreme example. This would be terrible. But this is extreme. And then I try to torque my body back this way to straighten it out. But the fact is I'm actually over here. And that's because I'm stuck in a flexion on one side only. That's the torquing. And I can see from some of the looks that maybe it makes a little bit of sense. I can't help but laugh whenever you say twerk. I think of a girl twerking. Twerking, you know, twerking, not twerking, Did twerking. twerking yes. <laughs> you don't want to see me twerk. Oh. Okay. So, Miss Giannis, should we, do we need to go through your stuff? I'd be happy to because I think that your answers were complete enough that everybody would get something out of them. I I think I get it now, but we can still if you want to. Uh, yeah, let's go through them quickly. If, it's, if it ends up being like, oh, everybody's got that, that's fine. But I don't think anybody objects to discussing this a tiny bit more and making sure we're on the same page. Because it's confusing. Okay. But by the way, everybody. <laughs> one last thing before we talk about Shona's homework. Because it's kind of kinesiology 101, and kinesiology 101 is not easy. <laughs> Here's our blue muscle again, okay? Muscles can only do one thing. Contract. So if it contracts, it's going to pull these pens closer to each other, right? What? Either this one comes to this one, or this one comes to this one, or they both come together. And what determines that this one comes to this one? What would cause it to do this? What would cause it to do that? Yeah, what would, keep, what would keep this one? What? Well, don't even worry about anything like that. But okay, just like, okay. what would keep this pen over here and this one comes to it? Is it because the one is the origin, so it doesn't move, and the other is the insertion, and it yeah. does? Yeah, and what makes the origin not move? It's anchored. To something that doesn't. That was, a, that was a great answer. It's anchored to something. It's either anchored because of gravity, like when I'm standing on my leg, that kind of anchors my leg. And so when this muscle tightens up, it just pulls my hip over because my hip's not anchored. My leg is, it's anchored by gravity and the 200 pounds I've got on it. Or it's anchored by another muscle. Your body's holding on to this one. That's how you create all the interesting actions you create, by the way, is you tense up a muscle and your body goes, I want this to come to this, so it tenses up this muscle too. If I tense up this muscle over here, it forces this one to come over here. If I didn't tense up this muscle, then when this contracted, this would go over there. 
So you use anchoring muscles. Those are called stabilizers or things like that. But you're right, either gravity or something anchors it, right? But the action doesn't change. The action is, this got closer. Still got closer. Whether you come to me or I came to you, we're closer. And so when we're talking about flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, all we really mean is this stuff is occurring. Now, you anchor this one, this occurs. You anchor this one, this occurs. But it's the same thing. The angle closes. The door closes either way. Either the door comes to the wall or the wall comes to the door. But they close. And that's a flexion. And this is an extension. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, all right. Let's let's look at your answers, Ms. Giannis. Okay, so you just want the one for the iliopsoas, the second question, right? I, I actually want any ones you want to discuss. Well, that was the only one I had a question on. Okay, cool. That's good. Then. Yeah, let's stick to it then. Okay. So I put that if it was unilaterally tight, it would create a lateral pelvic tilt, and then it would give an off-balance gait, and the body would look uneven from the sagittal plane, and so it looked lopsided yeah. when you're looking at it. Yeah. And I guess now I get what I got wrong was because it's, you're not, I don't know how to explain it. I understand like where I went wrong, you know? Do, uh, so I, did I, well, anyway, that's good. But um, let's talk about what you got right first, a lot. So you said the sagittal plane here. By the way, what you yeah. got right, everybody, is an extremely complete answer that you obviously really thought about, right? You actually gave me like three or four answers in that answer, correct? You said you think there'd be some lateral, did you say lateral tilt? Okay. And, okay, I disagree with that. That might be what's wrong. But still, you said that there would be a messed up thing in the sagittal plane, and that's probably true, right? We've got this, we've got this sagittal plane coming through me, and now I'm, tor I'm twisting, right? In fact, flexions and extensions don't mess you up in the lateral plane, in the sagittal plane. I'm staying in the sagittal plane this entire time. If the sagittal plane is a knife coming through me right now, it cuts me no matter whether I do a flexion or extension. But if I torque, I actually leave the knife. Not torque, torque. If I torque, I leave the knife. And so you actually said that. You said it causes, did you say that something like it causes you to have problems in the sagittal plane where you're actually leaving the sagittal plane. You are uneven in it. Yeah. So I guess if I was being nitpicky, I'm sorry if I was overly nitpicky with yours. Um, it would just be the lateral tilt. I'm actually disagreeing that it's lateral tilt. I think it's a uh, unilateral flexion that causes a, a twisting. Yeah. But the whole sagittal plane stuff is brilliant. Like, it's here. It causes me to twist. It causes me to bend on one side. But unfortunately, when I bend on one side, I fall to the other side. And that causes this twisting thing. And I'm now out of that mid-sagittal plane. Well, part of my body's in it. But part of my body's out of it. And that's a problem. Yeah. Miss Petrie, you have your hand up. Yes, but now I forgot what my question was. Now what? Now I forgot what my question was. Oh, okay. It might come back, it might not. It might. Um, they come and go. <laughs> so if, if any of you are feeling like overwhelmed, what I don't want you to do is regress. And so what I still want to point out is it's still true that all the muscles in front of your hip anteriorly tilt or flex your hip, all the muscles behind, um, uh, posteriorly tilt um, or extend the hip because they're in front. They literally just pull this bucket like this. Stuff truly on the sides can cause you to laterally tilt like your gluteus medius, you know. None of that's changed. Today we were talking about the iliopsoas that's deep. It's a core inner muscle that you will probably never touch as long as you're a massage therapist. There is a way to get to it through the belly, but it's very unusual. And that caused some really weird stuff. And we were kind of talking about this um, torquing, twisting today, because I wanted to introduce you one of the most complex problems that you can have, where one side of the body is doing something the other side isn't. Yes, Miss Momriel. 
I just wanted to say that I really appreciate how much time you take on letting us ask questions and explaining until we mostly get it, you know, because I know sometimes we're like, okay, okay, but you take so much time on it and I really appreciate it. And for that compliment, I'll take a gift certificate to the Thai restaurant. Okay. You know what, for that compliment, you deserve yeah. one. Um, do you know what a, a, a teacher's nightmare is? Um, and even just kind of me personally, because I like people and I like you guys, is for people not to care. So, right, all these questions came because you guys were like, I care, I tried, I worked on this thing. Why is it wrong? Nobody's here complaining like, I want a higher grade or whatever, which you can too, that's fine too. But no, it was, I care, I want to understand what's wrong, I want to be able to visualize it, I want to see it, I'm willing to look stupid, I'm willing to to ask dumb questions. None of them were dumb, but you know I mean? I'm willing to take those risks. I really want to learn. It's engagement. This is my favorite thing in the world. The class, it doesn't work actually without engagement. So I would hope that we would argue about like, no, TAP's going to go this way. And I'd be like, no, I think it goes this way. And I'd be like, maybe you're right. I don't know. Because now we're doing what we want you to do in your clinical setting, which is go, I think this person might be twisted. Why would they be twisted? Why would somebody twist? I'm used to this stuff, but why are they twisted? And you can't memorize that answer because it could be for different reasons. Like we want you to be thinking therapists. Even if you're wrong, we want you to be thinking therapists because we want you to be operating off something, right? Off some kind of thing of like, hmm. And look at what it did to your anatomy where you had to start to kind of bring ideas together and be like, oh, Kind of hurts your head in a good way. Yeah. Miss Petrie? Can you please remind me this sagittal plane, it runs up and down. Is that correct? Yeah, and let me talk. I still, get, I still get a little bit confused when yeah. any time planes is brought up. Yeah. Planes are a pain in the butt. Um, they're really important, but they're very confusing. So... Now, by the way, understanding where they are is not confusing. I'll, I'll remind you of that. That'll take one minute. But understanding, like, kind of visualizing what's going on. And I feel like that's kind of what we're doing today is trying to visualize stuff that's been in a two-dimensional book. But we're dealing with a three-dimensional body and a three-dimensional world. All right. So, sagittal plane divides my body from what? Side to side. That's how I remember it. Sagittal starts with an S. Side to side starts with an S. Now, this is just a side note, but I want to be very clear. Am I dividing my body from side to side here too? I am. It's not even, but it's side to side. So sagittal plane is any plane that cuts through your body from the front to the back and cuts you side to side. Normally when people are using sagittal planes, and what Ms. Giannis I'm sure meant was a mid-sagittal plane. Because we normally care... We normally use sagittal planes to be like, is this guy, is his body straight up and down side to side? So if my head's over here, but my chest is in the sagittal plane, we're like, well, something's wrong with his neck. Because the sagittal plane, the mid-sagittal plane's actually not even going through his head, but it's going through his just chest. And so we'd be yeah, like, he's uneven side to side. And that's what we use sagittal planes for. Here's the part that's hard to remember. The sagittal plane is coming through me from the front and it's going out and back of me forever. So if I walk forward, am I still in the sagittal plane? If I walk backwards, am I still in the sagittal plane? If I lean, I'm starting to leave that mid-sagittal plane. So when we talk about movements in the sagittal plane, it's so confusing. I am swinging my arm, believe it or not, in a sagittal plane right now. If you put a knife through it, it'd go through it all the way. If, because the knife goes infinity, right? This is the sagittal plane. Flexions and extensions happen only in the sagittal plane. Because if I flex right now, will this knife cut me? Yeah. And if this knife is behind me and I extend, will it cut me? Yes. And by the way, this is mid-sagittal. This is still sagittal. If my arm flexes here, will this knife cut me? Yes. If it extends, will it go back? I am actually moving in the sagittal plane. I'm in it. And I stay in it the whole time. That's what's really hard to visualize about planes. Uh, to this day, it kind of bothers me. But it's very useful in talking about stuff. So 
I am flexing in the sagittal plane, extending the sagittal plane, flexing the sagittal plane, extending the sagittal plane. All flexions and extensions happen in a set. Maybe not the mid sagittal plane, but a sagittal plane. They have because they go sagittal plane runs from your front to your back, and all extensions are in front and in back. All of them, right? Every time. So those occur in the mid sagittal or sagittal plane. And that's actually how we, we categorize flexions and extensions. We say they are movements. They're bending in the sagittal plane. You stay in the sagittal plane the whole time. I'm flexing my elbow and extending my elbow. It's still happening in the sagittal plane. Yeah. And that's, and by the way, that's in anatomical position, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I can stick my elbow out to the side, and, but I, that's not the point. Um, what's the plane that comes through the side of me? and divides me from front to back. Front. Frontal. Frontal plane. Frontal plane. So, this one, we tend to look at people from the side here, but we're looking at the frontal plane, we're trying to see like, does their butt stick out of the back of the frontal plane, and their head stick out the front? Like, are they aligned from front to back? That's what we use the frontal plane for. And think about this, this gets kind of confusing, but it makes perfect sense when you think about it. All abductions and adductions occur in the frontal plane. I stay in this plane the entire time I'm doing an abduction and adduction. So flexions and extensions happen in the sagittal plane, abductions and adductions happen in the sagittal, I mean in the frontal plane, sorry. What happens in the transverse plane. What movements can I do in the transverse plane where I stay in the transverse plane? Rotations. Rotations. Yes. <laughs> Even though I'm saying no, yes. If this thing's cutting through me, I'm rotating and I stay in that plane. Rotations happen in the transverse plane. Now, we don't use it for that normally. Normally, what we use the transverse plane for is to check if somebody's shoulders, if one shoulder's in the plane that we set here and the other one's above it. By the way, transverse plane can be anywhere. But I would set it here and be like, okay, let's look at this guy's shoulders. If one's like this and one's like that, I'd be like, well, there's a problem here. They're not even in the transverse plane. Yeah. And I don't even want you to memorize that. I want you to just kind of soak it in and think about it, you know? But it helps you kind of visualize planes. Yeah. You guys are almost tempting me to, uh, for future classes, sorry, you're my guinea pigs, to put time into the, the lesson to kind of come back to these concepts again and pull them back in, right? Because we talked about planes and then I didn't talk about them for months, right? And they tie in very closely into all this stuff. Yeah. Other questions? More questions on that? I just felt that that was really helpful because I didn't know how to explain some of the questions from last night. Like, how do I explain that that is moving that way? Yeah. Or, yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know what to say. Yeah, it's actually helpful to me as a teacher because your questions make me think, how should I better explain this? But if this? I can think about it in planes and know that I have the idea of right about planes and they say, oh, well, because it's moved out of this plane in this way, right? Yeah. Yeah. That would be one way of explaining it anyway? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a great way to explain it. Yeah. And confusing, but try it. Um, let's take a break. <laughs> it's a muscle. And let's just say for the sake of argument, it's attached to a bone on each side because usually they are. There's a bone over here, bone over here, right? And when, they, when it contracts, it gets shorter, right? So muscles are very powerful. And they can contract hard enough that they can tear themselves. Um, and your body has built-in sensors in your nervous system that stop you from tearing yourself. And there, there's two of them, two main ones. One are called muscle spindles, and one are called Golgi tendon complexes. 
Um, and they're called Golgi tendon complexes because they're usually found in high numbers in muscle tendons, but they can be found anywhere in the muscle. So the names aren't even that important. But um, Golgi tendon complex and muscle spindles are two different types of sensors that sense too much stretch in a muscle. And they do two different things. Um, and I hope I'm not flipping them. But if they sense too much tension here in the tendon, and they think, oh my gosh, um, Miss Stanley's horse fell over and she loves it and she's trying to pick it up because she loves it so much, but it weighs 2,000 pounds. And she's doing it with her biceps and her bicep tendon gets a stretch signal that's like we have never stretched like this before in our life. We're being pulled that hard. We think we're going to tear free from the bone. It sets off these sensors. And the sensors do one of two things. One is... They just shut off the muscle. They just cut power. So it stops pulling. Just won't do it. And it kind of cramping ever? I don't know about cramping. No. But it, Sometimes I wake like up randomly and my calf won't stop cramping and I get really mad and yell, stop. Yeah, that's a little bit different. You gotta just walk around for that one, by the way. <laughs> but I don't blame you. But no. It shuts power to it. So let me give you an example, like I remember once I was getting something out of my car when it was running and I reached in there, I was reaching the back seat. My car was idling, sitting still. The parking brake was on, but it was on. And when I was reaching in the back seat of my car, my right leg stepped out on the, on the gas pedal. And the car was, didn't go anywhere. It was in idle, like it's in neutral. But I mean, I heard it race and I was kind of stuck in the back seat. And I knew what I was doing, but I couldn't stop. I had to actually push off the pedal even more to get unstuck. And it redlined. It went up to like 12 grand. Well, cars aren't made to do that, but the car has a computer in it. Not old cars. New cars have a computer in it. And all of a sudden you hear it go, and then you hear it go, it didn't break. The computer said, oh, no, 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 no. We are not going to 12 grand in your little Honda Fit. And it just shut it back down. That's kind of what these things do. They say, Oh, no, no, Miss Stanley, you can't lift a horse. And you know what? We'd rather have our biceps still intact afterwards, and it shuts the muscle off. So that's our muscles redlining. <laughs> that's your muscles redlining. That's exactly right. That's a really good way of putting it. The other thing they will sometimes do, if they feel too much of a stretch, this is the muscle spindles, they'll cause another muscle to contract to stop it. So, like, if I throw a punch or throw a ball... I can easily throw my shoulder right out, but I get this stretch thing in back, and believe it or not, the muscles in back contract at the last minute to stop me. They actually stop me. So that's where an antagonist is automatically fired by your brain through these muscle spindles to stop an agonist before it rips. So either they shut off power, or they actually hold it back. So let's suppose my car wasn't idling, and it was in gear, it would be like something being like, no, you can't go driving off a, a 12 grand. And it would grab on the bumper and hold it like a, a truck behind it, an opposite car. So those are the two things those things do. And in PNF stretching, we're actually trying to get those to kind of relax so that they won't kick in so that we can stretch the person farther because they tend to kick in and be like, whoa, whoa what's going on? And it's like, dude, we're just stretching your bicep. It's okay. No, 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 Michael. And it's trying to shut off stuff in here and, and trying to stop you from stretching. And we actually want to kind of calm them down so we can stretch you further, gently, carefully. But but they're there. so violent. Yes. But they're there as safety measures. And it's why you guys can do stupid stuff. Like, um, you're at some party, and I don't know. I mean, I would never do this. But let's say you're at a party, you've had too much to drink, and you're dancing, and you're throwing your arms around, something like that. There's a reason you don't rip your arms out of your sockets. And it's these, these spindles and mu muscle Golgi tendon complexes kick in, and they stop me from actually throwing my arm back the extra inch it needs to go back to come out of socket, things like that. They do that automatically. I mean, I can be really nutty right now. I can be like, Aah! and I'm 51 years old, and I didn't tear anything, right? And I wasn't thinking. It's because it literally stopped me right when I'm getting right to this point where it's another muscle kicked in and pulled it and stuff. So that's what they are. They're safety mechanisms. They're governors on your on your motor. Does that help? Yeah, it's the thing that stops your muscle from redlining. Yeah. That's how I, that's how I learned that. Yeah. So it either stops it from redlining 
or it gets an antagonist to keep that muscle from going too far. One of those two things. Just depends on what's needed. Yeah. But yeah, it's, I mean, think about the stuff, your body has got to have all this self-protective stuff in it because you do lots of stupid stuff. I don't mean you, Miss Stanley, I meant human beings do. No, I do some stupid stuff. We, we push our bodies too far and, and think about it, people be dropping like flies, but your body has all these safety mechanisms built in. You drink too much alcohol, you usually throw up. Don't get me wrong, it's still very dangerous, but my point is your body goes, no, you're an idiot. I'm getting rid of this. You push your body yes. too, you put, you, you try to throw your arm too fast, too hard, because you're, I don't know, your body says, no, I want my shoulders intact. It shuts that down. It pulls that back. It does those things. Those are just built-in safety mechanisms that are very hard to override, actually. Isn't that like that disease that makes it to where your, your muscles don't know that and you can throw out your shoulder just because you don't have that? Probably. And you do have the ability to override some stuff. So if you consciously, consciously think like, I'm not going to respond to this, just like you can change your pain tolerance and all sorts of stuff, you can override it. But these are built-in things that tend to operate pretty automatically. Now, one of the things that does help to override Golgi tendon complexes and muscle spindles, adrenaline. Yeah. Because your body's super smart. <laughs> And it goes, well, normally I wouldn't want you to push so hard that you were tearing a muscle, but you're being attacked by a lion right now. And so I think that's going to be kind of worse than just tearing a little muscle right now. So I'll let you use all the available strength you have. And this is why you hear stories of like mothers lifting a car off their child in an accident. And later they don't feel so good because they have torn all these muscles like that, but their body literally allowed them to go full bore. And you're actually much yeah. stronger than you realize. I accidentally dislocated in my mom's horse's jaw once. She tried to attack my friend in a biting fit, so the only thing to get her to stop was I had to hit her really hard. Yeah. But so, we gotta go back. Yes. She's fine to this day. Good. I was hurting really bad after. Yes. So that's my point. So anyway, your body's amazing. Body's amazing. Miss Hunter, please. Oh, I was just, I really like this topic, so I was just like, I'm glad we, uh, we segue to this. Anyway, um, I uh, wanted to say, uh, even uh, when the adrenaline is coursing through people's veins and they're doing all these crazy things they normally wouldn't do, they also don't have, like, they, they don't feel the pain while it's happening. <laughs> like, like they tore all these things, but like, I guess their pain tolerance is gone or like the adrenaline or whatever they're focusing on is like, I don't know. I think that's awesome too. Anyway. <laughs> no, Miss Hunter, you make me smile by the way, Miss Hunter. Thank you. Oh, that's a really good point too. So pain is just your brain just telling you pain is a trick. Pain is your brain saying, I'm getting a signal from down here. I suspect you're really hurting your finger. I'm going to tell you it hurts so that you pull it away. It's a trick. So if you've got adrenaline going and your brain really thinks you're in trouble, it shuts off pain. It's like, it's in life or death mode. And Miss Hunter's absolutely right. I've done stuff before. I once ran into a tree stump <laughs> and it like cut my leg into the bone. I could see the bone. It didn't hurt at all until later, right? Because that's when the adrenaline wears off. And then you're like, oh my, my, this hurts a little bit. Um, but yes, so your body's amazing. It's got all these safety, safety things. So Golgi tendon complexes and muscle spindles help keep you from tearing muscles, help limit muscle action because muscles are darn strong and they can rip themselves free from bones. And you can throw stuff out of socket and you can tear stuff and they help stop that. Yes, Miss Stanley. And it is the dendrites that are pretty much the si they're signaling it? Yeah, that's that's just how nerves fire, that there's dendrites and axions and they're signaling across that stuff. Yes. You're talking about the wiring now. But these are at the end of the wiring. These are sensors at the end of the wiring. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Ybarra completely threw me in space yesterday. I was like, what did you just say? It's a lot. It is. Wait. Um, so the Golgi or Golgi tendon is at the end of... Um, they tend... They are, they, no. Well, yes. Sorry. It's at the end of a nerve. Yes. And they tend to be found in tendons. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, okay. want to, I didn't even want to introduce dendrites because it starts getting confusing. They're the wiring of your nervous okay. system, and they are the sensor at the end. Yeah, remember how I said you got, like, no C sensors that are pain sensors? You've got Golgi tendon complexes and muscle spindles, too. These, ten, okay. these, these sense tension and stretch. Yeah. 
Spindles tend to send stretch in the muscle. There tend to be more of the muscle belly, and they keep your muscle from tearing. Golgi tendon complexes tend to sense force in the tendon and stop tearing there too, though. Yeah. And they are sensors in your nervous system that send automatic signals to your brain. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I feel like this isn't what's planned. Um, actually, we are bringing together multiple concepts, right? When you guys all started class with me, we had to chop up the human body and chop up terms in all these places, and we had to teach them to you. We are now starting to bring them all back together, and we're seeing how complex that is. But the cool thing is you have a much bigger picture of how stuff works. Can you imagine if we would have talked about Golgi tendon complexes day one? Here's what I would have had to do. I would have had to talk about muscles, right? And I would have to tell you how muscles work and that they contract. I would have to tell you about the sarcomeres, remember that? And the railroad cars and how, how the actin and, and uh, myosin pull each other. And that would have been three days of that. But then I would add to say, hey, by the way, muscles attached to bone. That's the whole reason we're talking about this. That's why you might actually have to have a Golgi tendon organ to stop them. And we had to talk about bones, everything like that. We had to, had to explain that tendon really attaches muscle to bone. But the tendon actually runs through the whole muscle. And we had to talk about fascia. That had taken four or five days. And... Then we would have to say, well, there's these Golgi tendon, tendon, Golgi tendon complexes or organs that are in there uh, sensing stretch in case you go too far. And you'd be like, well, how do they stop that? Well, you've got this thing called the nervous system. So now i got to explain how the brain, the spinal cord, and the wiring, which is made up of these dendrites and axions and all that kind of stuff. Explain about all that wiring and talk about um, the uh, chemical messengers that you know, leap across the thing and send messages and talk about these things and how they send stress, uh, uh, sense stretch and bring it all back up there to stop this thing from contracting. All of that to explain that a Golgi tendon complex is the governor for the, the engine of your muscles. And you guys were talking about a hundred concepts like that. So that's why we had to break them all up and bring them all back together. We have to talk about muscles first, bones first, nervous system first, flexions, extensions, actions, individual muscles, and then start to bring them back together in this big thing. That's what we're doing. So this is exactly what we should be doing right now. Whew. You probably didn't realize how smart you guys were. Yes, it confused my brain too, Ms. Moore. Let's go back and let's back up a little bit now. Okay? Let's take a break from multi-concept things that cause flexions and extensions that cause twisting and rotating in different planes and then the Golgi tendon complexes to stop the concentric and eccentric and isometric contractions when we're PNF stretching, and I'm just making stuff up now. Let's talk about uh, the muscles that we had last night in real simple terms. I think you guys will realize how much you know. So it'll kind of let you congeal a little bit here. All right. We are teaching at a level higher than the book you are in. We are teaching at a level higher than the book you were in. Here is a side picture of the psoas major. You guys can, I know I've asked this before, but I always forget. Can you see my cursor over here? You can't, good. So here's the psoas major going down inside the hip into what's called the uh, lesser trochanter. And the they don't show the iliacus here, but it's in here. We're going to see it in the next slide, I think. And it goes down in here, too. They all kind of run down in here. And this is why you bend over or you lift your leg or you anterior tilt or you flex when this muscle tightens up. And this is why you can't rub it very well. Look where you'd have to put your hand to get to that muscle. You'd have to go inside somebody, underneath somebody's stomach and intestines. And people don't like that. All right, let's talk about the tensor fascia lata, or fe tensor fascia latte. Wait, can we go back yeah. to the last one? I just found out, did you say lesser or greater trochanter? Lesser. Okay, thank you. Do you want me to show it to you on a skeleton really quick so you understand? Um, let's see if I have a, here, hold on. This is good. I've got a partial body here. Okay. So this is the hips, obviously, right? 
This is your greater trochanter out here, right? Your lesser trochanter is underneath here. This thing comes from inside your body to inside your leg. I'll show you from the back side and you'll be able to see it better. This is your greater trochanter out here. This is your lesser trochanter. It's a tiny muscle, a tiny bump on your bone inside your leg. You can't even touch it because you've got so much adductors over there. I've never felt a lesser trochanter in my life. I feel these all the time. You can feel them right now on you. Rub the side of your hip, that bone, that's this sucker. Rub up higher, you hit, you'll feel this, your crest, your ilium. Rub down lower, though, that's your greater trochanter. But try to reach inside your leg right now and try to find this bump. You can't get to it. I don't know how you would. You'd have to go through that much. Where is my hand? You'd have to go through that much tissue to get to it. But anyway, greater trochanter, lesser trochanter. It's on the inside of the leg. And so this muscle runs from up here down inside your leg in there, which is why it causes these flexions when it contracts because it attaches your low back and your hip to your leg inside though. That help? Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, all right. The tensor fascia lata or tensor fasciae latte, um, tenses a lot of fascia. Tenses a lot of fascia. Your IT band, your iliotibial tract, runs across two joints because it comes from the crest of your ilium down to your tibia. So that means it goes over two joints, your hip and your knee. And the tensor fascia lata is used to tighten that up. And yes, it can help abduct your hip and stuff like that, but and a little bit of medial rotation, but the flexion is what's important because this can be one of the things that can be involved in uh, an anterior tilt of the pelvis. So actually now, once again, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can show you guys something on me. All right. So. My IT band goes down to my tibia. That's my leg bone down here. Oh my fibula. And it comes from the crest of my ilium all the way up here. Okay, it's long. So, when it tightens up, it helps me not blow my knee out laterally. My knee wants, especially when I'm turning, my knee wants to go out laterally. If it tightens, it helps pull my knee in and protect it laterally. It's on the lateral side, it helps me to keep from blowing out my knee laterally. What's cool about it is you don't want it tight all the time. Sometimes I'm running straight forward and I don't want it that tight. I want to be able to move straight forward. I only want it tight when I'm doing lateral movements. If it's tight when I'm running straight forward, guess what it does? It clicks, if it's really tight, it clicks over my greater trochanter. And it clicks <coughs> over, <coughs> excuse me, clicks over um, my epicondyles of my femur and stuff. It clicks over them because it runs by them. Shoot, come here. So it'll actually rub by these every time you take steps. And people actually get iliotibialitis, ititis. They get inflammation of this thing if it's too tight. The other thing, if it's too tight, because it's a little bit in front, it can cause anterior tilts. And just so you have an idea where it is, gluteus maximus, medius, minimus, tensor fascia lata. Max, med, min, tensor fascia lata. Max, med, min, TFL. Max, med, min, TFL. Max, med, min, TFL. I don't know why I'm the only one doing this, but that's what I've been Max, med, min, TFL. Because it's right here. And so when I work on somebody with anterior tilt, I'm often getting my arm right down in this area because I hit the gluteus medius, minimus, and TFL right in here by doing that. So that's part of its significance. 
But the other part is, it's kind of cool what it does. It's kind of in front. You see how it's angling forward? What does it tie to in back? It ties to my glutes in back. So the TFL also ties to my glutes, and they triangulate me here. Very important your stability. Your glutes come in from the back, your gluteus maximus comes in from the back, and the TFL's in front, and they run down into your IT band. And your IT band is this, basically this long tendon that runs down across your knee to your leg. So what worries me is this next part I'm going to tell you, because it's kind of fascinating, and it's very simple, but it's going to confuse you, but I'm going to tell you anyway because I believe in you. People think of the IT band as just a belt of fascia going down their leg, and that's not completely true. Where is fascia around my leg? Everywhere. So my pants would be fascia if this was muscle. This is just a thicker area of fascia. So my IT band is more like my pants rolled up and extra tight in this area. There's fascia everywhere. The IT band is actually woven into the fascia that surrounds my leg. Why is that important? Because when the TFL tightens down, it also tightens up my entire thigh fascia, which makes my quads lock down to my leg better and makes them more powerful. So you gotta remember my entire leg is wrapped in fashion. It's not like God just put a belt or a fashion on top of that. No, it's that God kind of made this fascia so much thicker right here that it feels like it's a band going down. It does move, but it tied into the fascia around my leg as well. So it's all interrelated. But we call it the IT band. It really should be called like the IT trail because there's still stuff around the trail over here. It's just the thicker portion of that. Okay, let's go back. Uh, yes, Ms. Torres. I have a question. Please. So, you know how you can make muscles bigger. Can you make more fascia or can you make it bigger? Yeah, you can stretch your fascia if, if that's what you mean. And yes, um, we do it all the time. Um, unfortunately, no, 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 not, not stretching. I, I know you can stretch oh, it. Oh, you mean thicker. But you, yeah, like thicker or like, can you build more to it? You, you yeah. Know how you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, bones uh, or muscles, you yeah. can do that. Yeah, uh, yes, you can. So, uh, and you do all the time. We all do. And if you listen to like top athletes now that are working with like really good athletic trainers now, you'll hear them sometimes not talk about training their muscles. You'll hear them talk about training their fascia. So let me give you an example. When I do a squat like this, and I stop here, and I get back up, that's my muscle. That's my muscle pulling my body back up, contracting and pulling my body back up. It's my hamstrings pulling, my glute max pulling, all sorts of my quads, you know, extend, um, extending so I can get back up. That's muscle, right? But most athletes aren't doing that. What are most athletes doing? They're jumping and bouncing around. That's muscle and fascia. In fact, fascia is an energy conserver. Fascia is the elastin. Remember, it's made of elastin and collagen. The collagen is the steel, but the elastin is the flexibility part, making you bouncier. And it does get thicker and gets thicker in the directions of the type of exercise you do. So if you go bouncing down the hallways all the time, or let's say you're a runner, yes, your calves get stronger, but your fascia in that area actually gets thicker, so you've got more rubber band. That's why they kind of go bouncing down the street. That's why they're able to run so long. They're bouncing on rubber bands. And the rubber bands get thicker depending on the type of work you do and the demands you put on it. And so if you're constantly stretching your fascia and having it come back together and stretching your fascia and resting it too, it's got to rest, it does get thicker, yes. Absolutely, you grow your fascia. It grows well, slower than muscle, but yes, that's what so you do. So why nobody talks about this? Like everybody talks about the muscle, but they don't talk about the, like, about fascia, like they go together. 
Yeah. Like why? Why it's always the muscle, 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 but never fascia? Well, uh, thank you, by the way. Um, for one thing, they didn't really know the importance of fascia until about 20 years ago, which is not that long ago. Um, the general public can't handle the concepts. I don't mean they're stupid, but I meant look at how much we've had to learn just to talk about fashion and really kind of understand what we're talking about, right? It's taken us now four months. Uh, and it would take anybody four months. That's not a, that's just a fact. So it's just not general public stuff. Think about all the stuff in, in like each one of you is probably an expert about something that just isn't normal public knowledge because there's too much to kind of explain, right? It's a lot of, people want simple answers, right? I'm going to the gym to work my muscles out because they burn extra calories. Well, that's true. That's true. Now, when I'm an Olympic athlete and I'm competing against people all over the world, there's Olympic trainers there. They're like, let's start training your fascia because we really care about it. We study this stuff. And we know exactly what we're doing. And, but the guy at the gym doesn't care. I just want my pecs to be bigger. Right? I just want to, I just want to, you know? So, it's just, it's just what's, it's just, it's just not, you know, common. And the other thing you're going to find out too, um, is that medical fields are so segmented now because there's so much to know about the human body that they don't talk to one another. So, you talk to a fascia, fasciologist and that's what they talk about. You talk to a surgeon, they talk about surgery. Talk to a chiropractor, they talk about adjusting you. Um, they, they, we tend to get very specialized in our fields. Anyway, I think it's highly important. Uh, by the way, there are international fascia conferences now. I mean, it's a big deal. It's not like I'm telling you something weird that doesn't exist. And this picture that we're looking at all right now, all that white is fascia, but all the muscle has fascia around it. There's literally fascia. There's actually more fascia than there is muscle in a muscle. Because fascia wraps around over every fiber of the muscle and then every group of fibers and then the whole muscle together and then everything. It's everywhere. So, yeah. It's just when we first discovered the human body, we were curious how it moved. And we looked at the most simple thing. And it's kind of like looking at a car, by the way. And you go, well, the car moves because of the engine. Well, that's true. And so you get all in engines. We can make them faster and we can do this stuff. <clears throat> but is a transmission important? Suspension? aerodynamics, fuel efficiency. I mean, all these things come into play and then we're just learning more about the human body. Anyway, this is the IT band and it runs across the hips and the knee and it ties into the gluteus maximus and back and it ties in the front here. And the best way to work this is to work right underneath the crest of the ilium. And there's lots of simple ways to do that too. When you're at the side of somebody's body, just grabbing over their hip and pulling towards you is a great way to grab the tensor fascia lata, gluteus minimus, gluteus medius, and all the way back to gluteus maximus. Just grab way over the hip. Yes, Ms. Petrie. And the purpose of the TFL is that it supports the IT band to prevent from blowing out the knee laterally. That, yes, that, that's one big purpose, right. yes. Is that it can okay. choose to tense up a lot of fascia so that there's support on the laterals. Knees, knees are kind of crappy. They're like this. And they're right. great at this pressure, and they do this all day long really well. But if they get hit from the side, they tend to do this. We've all seen this in a sporting event. It's horrible. You see it from a distance, and you actually watch the knee go out. They don't have a lot of side support. So they've got some ligaments there and stuff like that that help them. But this way, you've got this huge TF... Uh, this huge IT band coming down here, holding it so that when I'm going forward and all of a sudden I decide to go right, my leg still wants to go forward. <laughs> Something's got to keep it from busting out to the side as I go right. And by the way, when you watch sporting events, it's always when they cut laterally that their knee goes. I shouldn't say always, but 95% of the time it is. Boom. They go, they, they turn really quick and the knee keeps going the other direction. <laughs> it's all over. That's what the IT band is there for. Yes. Um, the other thing is it gives power to the quads when they need it and all sorts of stuff because it helps tighten down all the fascia on there too and stuff. But that's, that's one of its big, big things that it does. Yes, Miss Stanley. So when somebody's knee blows out, does it like just shred the existing fascia that was there? Yeah. I shouldn't use terms like blows out. That doesn't mean anything, but. And can it come back? Uh, it's not good. So. 
The problem is when your knee goes out to the left or the right, when it goes out laterally or immediately, uh, tendons and ligaments have to tear. And ligaments are highly avascular without blood. And they take a long time to repair and it usually takes surgery because they have to sew them back in. If they're completely torn, it's not good. Now, sometimes you buckle your knee, right? Sometimes you take that turn really quick and you feel that little wobble and you're like, ah, and it hurts for a couple months afterwards. You've probably torn a little bit of fascia and you've probably stretched a little bit, but it heals on its own. But if you're, you know, you're this athlete and I'm a 300 pound football player and I'm running down the field, that's 300 pounds on my knees. And then I cut this way and my femur goes out over my tibia. That's a serious, that's probably the end of my sports career. They can, so they'll put my knee back together and they'll sew back in the ligaments and stuff, but that's a serious injury. Remember, when somebody tells you they tore a muscle, okay, I mean, I, I feel for you and that stinks, but no big deal. When somebody's torn a ligament, that's a big deal. Or a tendon, that's a big deal. They take a long time to repair. If it's a total tear, that's a problem. And knees can be total tears. Plus, you've got ligaments inside your knee. You've got an anterior cruciate ligament and a posterior cruciate ligament. There are kind of these little crosses in there. And, and those tear too quite often when you do this kind of movement. You've also got little a medial and lateral collateral ligaments that hold your knee together. If those tear too, that's a problem. They're all there to kind of hold your knee together side to side. So let me ask everybody this question. If the IT band gives stability to your knee laterally, what gives stability to your knee medially? Your adductors? <laughs> you know what gives stability to your knee medially? It's Miss Monreal gives stability to your knee medially. Has Anseritis? Yeah, the goose foot has anseritis. So let me explain that really quick. Here. I promise you later you'll be like, I'm so glad we learned all this stuff because they just don't teach it in other schools. But this white band coming down on the lateral side of the leg, what is this band? Yeah, Miss Petrie just mouthed it. IT band? IT band, good, okay. So we're gonna go to the inside of the leg now, okay? Inside the leg, this is the medial side. We've got the semi Tendinosus hamstring happens to hook here. We've got the gracilis happens to hook down here. And we've got the sartorius coming over to hook down here. And they all come here on the medial side of the leg. So this is your IT band on your medial side of your leg. It's not really an IT band. I'm just trying to make a point, right? These three muscles triangulate down to help give stability to the inside of your knee. The IT band does it to the other side. This is the pes anseritis, right up here, holding the inside of the knee together. It's the a hamstring from the back, an adductor from the middle, and a sartorius across the front, all meeting down here on the medial knee to help hold the knee together. Yeah, that's why this area is kind of sensitive to it. It actually has a lot of pressure on it. Does that at least generally make sense? Like, yeah, good. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. It's kind of cool. All of this, by the way, what's really cool about all this is your body, Mother Nature, God, has to overcome this huge problem with the human body, which is it needs to be flexible and go limp, and it needs to be rigid, and it needs to switch back and forth between those things. So the knees have to have lots of movement, but they can't have movement out to the side, and sometimes they need to be tight, sometimes they need to be loose, and sometimes they need to be flexible and bend over, and sometimes they need to be rigid and hold heavy stuff up. And so your body has all these mechanisms to tighten things up and loosen them up and protect them, and that's where all this stuff comes from. And you're tall. You're tall. The shortest of you are tall. You've got tiny little feet, and you've got this big body up here. 
You know, I mean, I wear a size 10 shoe. I got 230 pounds on top of that thing. Towering over that. My body's like, we got to keep these knees together. Yeah, it's amazing. Anyway, so that's, that's the concept of the IT band, right? But it gives people a lot of problems. And so it's just a really good thing to kind of know it's there. You can rub it. Um, if you have to rub the IT band itself, according to Tap Scott, not to anybody else, is it better to rub it proximally or distally? I know some of you know this because I've talked to you some about it at the beginning of school. Is it better to rub it proximally or distally? Let's see. Miss Montreal, yes. Um, totally guessing. Talking about the direction of the stroke, proximal or distal? Yes, and I, anyway, I'm just going to say what I'm going to say. Yeah, say it. So I guess proximal. Why? But I feel like maybe, I don't know if I thought I remembered you saying distal, but I would think, I don't know, but just as far as me, like you can apply more pressure pushing up than going down. Yeah. Because you have a little bit of resistance because of the hip. I don't know. That's my thing. By the way, you're thinking if you need more pressure is completely right and stuff like that. I disagree with it, but I just meant like, like, you can make an argument for everything I say. Um, a legitimate one. Did you say one. before, though, to go distal? Distal. I thought I remembered you saying that, but I was like, just saying what made sense in my head. Let me explain why really fast for everybody. Really fast. Um, let's get this down here. All right, can you see a skeleton here? I hope. Should I stop sharing? So I don't know if that helps. All right. This is hard to envision. The skeleton, the skeleton does not show this well, but your hips are here and your femur runs down at an angle. It actually bows in a little bit. So your femurs are actually kind of like this. And if you rub up, as you come up, you hit more and more bone and more and more bone. And eventually you hit the greater trochanter and that hurts. If you run down, it's just a gentler way to rub it. This is distal, by the way. This is me getting more distant. I recommend you rub IT bands distally. You don't need more power. I, what? I thought that you were supposed to rub towards the heart. You are. You are. And that's what I honestly meant. I wasn't just trying to be nice to Miss Montreal. I honestly meant, like, she could argue all day long and win the argument with a large group of massage therapists that, sh that you should rub it the other way. You could win the argument saying you should rub towards the heart. I mean, I do, I do it both ways. I right. do proximal and distal when it comes to legs. Yeah. I, I well, yeah. And that's the fourth argument that you shouldn't waste strokes, right? You shouldn't rub, lift your hand up, rub, lift your hand up, rub, lift your hand up. So no matter which of our ways we choose, there's something that's not going right, right? If we rub distally, yes, we don't pinch the bone as much. And it's gentler for the client. But we're moving away from the heart. And we lose power. If we do Miss Petrie's way, we go both ways and we get a much more efficient massage and we're not wasting strokes and we don't have landings and takeoffs. If we do Miss Montreal's way, you've got more force and more power, which saves your body. We're all right. We just need to know why we're right so that we affect what we're doing because of it. For example, Miss Petrie, I actually agree with you. I don't want landings and takeoffs, so I do rub it both directions. But I rub it soft, proximally, hard, distally. Because it's more painful when I go proximal to the client. So I actually change my hand position and do it lighter up, harder down. For that reason. Because I'm trying to blend in what you're saying. And I don't personally care about the heart thing. But that's just me. Yes, Miss Montreal. Oh, well, you kind of answered. I, I was just going to say, so it would be good to do a little bit of everything then. Oh, gosh, yes. What I would really, for one thing, I, I don't think you should ever do a stroke in just one direction because you should not be having landings and takeoffs. You're wasting too much time. You're losing half your massage is gone. So I would rub it both directions. But I'm rubbing it harder as I go away from it because the bone's going away from me. So this is gentler to the client. Whereas when I come up, I'm scissoring the bone because the femur comes out like this. So as my hand goes up, I'm actually creating a scissor. And that's painful. So when I come up, I actually turn my hand out like this so it's gentle. And when I come down, I knife into it and pull back down. Gentle, harder. Gentle, harder. 
And so, and how I learned that was having this concept. So I don't actually care what you guys do. I, if you're rubbing away from it and you're aware that this is, or you're rubbing towards it and you're aware you can scissor, then you'll do something about it and maybe use the palm of your hand. That's all I care about. It's just to be aware of how the mechanics work so that you adjust whatever you're doing for that reason. Does that make sense? There's just, there's not a right answer. But the wrong answer is to be like, oh, it just doesn't matter. It matters all over the place. But since you're aware that you could be scissoring, then let's change this position. Or since you're aware of this, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Cool. All right. Let's go. Let's try to. So that's IT band. I feel like there's a very high level discussion today. A little above my head. All right. IT band. Boom. Um, Sartorius. We already talked about this. It inserts into the pes anserinus and is part of the mismon real goose foot that stabilizes the medial leg. Look at the actions there. It can flex the hip and the knee and laterally rotate the hip. I guess it can immediately rotate the knee like they say, but who cares? But anyway, it can cause you to do a hacky sack. It can cause me because it goes, just so you can see this. You guys should do this with yourselves, by the way. You should grab onto your pants and things like that. But that's my sartorius. If I pull it, of course it's gonna cause a flexion of my hip, which means it can cause an anterior tilt. But anyway, because it crosses the knee, it can also cause me to bend my knee. So that's called flexing my knee, flexing my hip, and because it's diagonal, it can cause me to laterally rotate. So flex hip, flex knee, laterally rotate, and that's how I sit like that. And by the way, some people told me in their homework, they said it allows me to do that. And I'm like, totally cool, and you're 100% right, but I want you to tell me that in anatomical terms. Anatomical terms are flex my hip, flex my knee, immediately rotate my hip. Like I want you to use medical terms when you're describing stuff, if you can. Cool, cool, cool. Anyway, that's Satorius. Remember what I told you about the Satorius too that I find very interesting about it? Is many therapists are rubbing up the thigh and they run over it and they think it's a bump. They think it's a knot. But it's really just this diagonal rope that they're going out across. They stretch out and they pop over it. And there's nothing wrong with popping over it. But just don't think that it's a knot in the middle of the thigh when it's really a muscle going across diagonally. <laughs> Be aware it's there. Be aware it's there. You can actually find it and feel it and move it back. It's super superficial. It's very thin. But it's super superficial. It's the most superficial thigh muscle. It's the sartorius. Yeah? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, I was gonna see if I had a picture. Oh, I might. So. Hey, this is pretty good. Yeah, all right. Let me see if I can share this with you guys really quick. Hold up. We'll come back to that in a second. Let's stop sharing that. Bear with me one more second here. Tab. All right. Do we see this guy right here? I can't see you guys, so I'll take that as yes. This is his sartorius. It's very thin muscle, so it's hard to see on people unless you're really lean. It's over here too, but it's hard to see. But anyway, people rub up the thigh and they pop over that. They have a hard time seeing it. He is gross. Well, he is what he is. Wait, uh, Mr. Tapscott. Yeah. Fun fact, go back to that Google image for a second. Yeah, do you want me to show? Show it on the screen. Okay, hold on. It's coming. Here we go. Okay, yeah. All right, so that. All right, so the second lady down with the red on her, that was my PE teacher. <laughs> this lady? No, the two above her. That That's, lady. It's your PE teacher? Yeah. It's there's, really cool. there's her sartorius right there. Yeah, so 
she she didn't look like that while I was while she was our PE teacher because she used to be a bodybuilder, but like uh, she she told us pictures, showed us pictures and stuff. I mean, like if she told me to dress up for PE, be like, yes, ma'am, whatever you say. We're doing whatever you, dodgeball. You got it. Whatever you want. Okay. Um. Amazing. Yes, human body is amazing. All right. And last but not least, let's look one last time. It's been a long, intense day of important stuff. Um, at the iliopsoas. Remember the iliopsoas is two muscles, two muscles, two muscles. There's the psoas major going to the lesser trochanter, and there's the iliacus, which is inside the hip, inside the hip going to the uh, lesser trochanter too. Ms. Torres, are you talking to us, or did you just forget your mic's on? Oh, sorry, I was talking to Allison. That's okay, I just want to make sure. What I was going to say, anyways, first PE, first PE teacher that is in shape. Yeah, that's true, right? It's always, it's usually always some guy like me driving a golf cart around telling you to run. Yeah, cracks me up. It's so true. That's why you're laughing, because it's true. Uh, yes, Ms. Monreal? Um, so I have a question as far as our class, uh, our anatomy and physiology that we go over. Yeah. Because I've had like some people say like, oh yeah, well I took anatomy, yet they don't know any of the stuff we're going over. Sure. So just in comparison to a college class, what would you compare it to? Is it a little more extensive than what you would go through with basic anatomy? Yes and no. Here's the here's the thing. This is why it's so tricky because we actually had the college talk to us and say, hey, we love what you guys are doing. Can we make the classes in or transfer and stuff? Here's the problem. We teach muscular anatomy way above a college anatomy class. This stuff is tough because we're teaching it that hard. However, we taught system um, anatomy, things like your heart, your lungs, your nervous system, all that stuff. I know that might have seemed confusing. But that was below a college level course. I mean, you really might have gotten that in a health sciences course in high school, to be honest with you. We didn't go much. I mean, really, honestly, what did you really learn about the heart with me? It had four chambers, arteries go away from the heart, veins go back to the heart. There's one way valves and veins, there's the atrium and the ventricles. But we didn't, that's not very much to know about the heart. So we learned very low level general anatomy. We learned extremely high level muscular anatomy. Because everything we learn is for massage, massage, massage. That's the benefit of a trade school, though, too, is you don't have to learn 35 other things that aren't important to your trade. So that's why when you talk to other people, you're like, well, you took anatomy, but you don't know about all these muscles, and you don't know about all these flexions and extensions. No, they don't. No way. They didn't even probably touch on that stuff. Uh, but they would turn to you and be like, um, you don't know about the different valves in the heart and why they're different and why they, how they contract and all that kind of stuff. You don't know about, you know, and you'd be like, no, we barely touched on that because we don't touch hearts. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah. And I like that about our course. Um, but yes, if you go to Phoenix uh, College, Phoenix Community College, they have a really good massage program. I'll give it to them. I really like them, and I really like the lady who runs it. Uh, it's the only other school I, would, I send students to besides ours. Uh, but when you go there, you take general biology, and you take all these general college courses, and then you go take their specialized massage courses. And... Um, it's just a different approach, right? But you can take some of their courses and apply them to a future health science degree if you want. And you can't do that with our stuff because it's too specialized. People are like, great, you know, you're not muscular anatomy like the back of your hand, but you still have to take an anatomy course because you didn't really learn all the anatomy at all. Okay, uh, I just want you to see this picture of the iliopsoas and really recognize the iliacus is a muscle inside the hip. The psoas major is a muscle that attaches to the inside of your lower back, and they both go to the lesser trochanter, which is why we call them the same thing. Iliacus and psoas major, because we think they do the same thing, and we think they have to act together. We don't think they really have much of a choice. Does that make sense? They both go to the same place, they both pull the same way, all that good stuff. There's a picture of the iliacus. And look what it says here, flexes the hip, um, tilts the pelvis anteriorly, 
flexes and tilts, you're always going to see those two together. Uh, okay, I think that's it, but I want to show you on a body something. Okay, so bear with me. Let's put that up. Let's stop sharing really fast just so you can see. Let's knock this down. They literally mean inside the hip. In in this, in this, this inner part of the hip is where the, where the uh, iliacus lives. So it's inside the hip, it actually attaches this whole area here, this, this red area here, and it goes down into the leg. So in order to get to it on somebody, if you really want to get the iliacus, you can touch right here on the edge of it. Most people aren't going to let you go much more than that over their hip bone and down in here. No way. And the psoas major, you can kind of come in from the side right around their belly button. You can kind of hit it right here, but that's about it. So I think it's best to stretch it. So what movement, don't, you don't have to describe how to do a stretch, but what hip movement would stretch the iliopsoas? An extension of the hip? Miss Giannis? You're 100% correct. And you just told us the opposite of its action, right? Because the opposite, I'm going to say it again. I, I don't mean that snotty. Like, I'm going to say it again. I just want to let you know. I'm repeating this for a reason. The opposite of any muscular's action stretches it. Because actions contract and get shorter. So the opposite of any action, any muscle, not, there, this isn't all kind of true, always true, will stretch it. So if bending over flexes my iliopsoas, bending back, extending, you know, pulling my leg back, whatever, we'll stretch it every time. Now, figuring out how to do that is a whole other trick, but the point is that always works. If, if, if my bicep uh, causes a flexion of my elbow, then an extension of my elbow stretches my bicep every time, every time. Uh, Ms. Cooper, you still have your hand raised. Do you have a question?